Uh, as I made clear in my remarks, great powers, when they feel threatened, often do horrible things. They do very bad things to weak countries when, when they feel threatened. And yes, great powers tend to define what they see as their vital interests for themselves. That's what all great powers do. That's what all countries do. That's what sovereignty is all about. The issue is not, in fact, whether we thought expanding NATO was a threat to Russia. We told them repeatedly that it wasn't a threat to Russia. The issue on the table was whether Russia thought it was a threat. And, and as Bill Burns reported back, all of the people he spoke to in Russia thought that the incorporation of Ukraine was a threat to Russia's vital security interests. Now, Mike and will... we didn't do it. But, uh, <laughs> because we listened uh, to them. Excuse me, this is my time, Go ahead. not Go ahead. yours. Sorry, sorry, sorry. All right. Mike, Mike will tell you it was all about democracy as if there was no connection between moving democracies closer to, the Soviet, or to, closer to Russia and possibly having that be contagious. Again, as we made clear, that was exactly what uh, Russia was worried about. Partly NATO enlargement, partly EU accession, and partly the spread of democracy. Um, finally, since the opposition research is legitimate here, let me read you some quotations from former Ambassador McFaul. <laughs> the central purpose of American foreign policy is to defend against and, where possible, destroy tyranny. Notice the word destroy there. To promote liberty requires the elimination of those forces opposed to liberty, be they individuals, movements, or regimes. Thus, this should be the lofty and broad goal that organizes American foreign policy for the coming decades, right? And this yeah. was the man whom the United States sent as its ambassador to Russia. Now, if you're Russia, having been invaded multiple times from the West, and you're seeing the world's most powerful alliance led by the world's most powerful country steadily moving closer, and every time you protest, they offer you a bunch of pablum, but they never take these issues off the table, you might have a reason to be concerned when prominent American officials are saying that our goal is to promote liberty by destroying opposing forces, and that means destroying your regime, maybe not now, maybe not next week, but eventually if we ever get the chance, one way or the other. Russia had reasons to be concerned. They had reasons to be fearful. We don't have to think we were a threat. The question is, they saw us as a, th as a threat. And until we acknowledge their security concerns, the war will continue. Steve, I, I apologize. I did interrupt you. If you want to take some of my time, feel free. Seriously. I mean, no, I'm, I'm more polite. Okay. <laughs> Okay, um, one footnote, what he quoted me uh, from, and I, I, I stand by those words, I wrote those words right, right in the wake of September 11th, uh, when my country was attacked by people that did not believe in liberty, and that's, that, that may have been some of the emotion. I did not support the Iraq war, but I don't want to play the whataboutism game. That's not interesting. That's not the resolution. I want to make two points. One, I worked in the U.S. government. It's not an abstraction to me. We worked with the Russians to listen to their security interests. And to emphasize what Roddick said, there was no eminent threat, if it was a threat, I don't believe NATO is a threat to Russia. And I have millions of Russians who are on my side with that. And the president who almost became president, but for Putin, uh, back in 2000, Boris himself, radically agreed with me too. So please stop saying Russia believes this, Russia believes that. I was the ambassador of Russia. I never met Mr. Russia or Ms. Russia. There's Putin and there's interest groups and there's ideology. And you guys believe that about America. Why is it so hard to think that other countries might have those factors too? But number two, we didn't do it. That's the whole point. It was frozen after Bucharest. It didn't expand. And when I hosted President Zelensky the day after he saw Biden, last September, he said, Mike, you guys play this game, don't you? You, you have this strategic ambiguity stuff. And, and he said, I don't understand it. He was a new guy, right? But the truth was, when I was in the government, Tbilisi knew that they weren't getting into NATO. Kiev knew, Washington, Brussels knew, and Putin knew. I met with him. 
that was not on the table. What was on the table is the things that our opponents don't like to think that might be independent actors. I said, Putin is an independent actor. Well, guess what? The United States doesn't control the world. We don't get to tell Ukrainians, hey, Ukrainians, you don't get to protest because that's not in Putin's interest. That's not in his interest. Don't go on to Maidan. Remember in 2013, what happened there? Yanukovych decided not to sign an agreement with the EU, and a guy named Mustafa Naim said, that's outrageous, we deserve to be in Europe. And he didn't get a phone call from me, he didn't get a phone call from Barack Obama, he, went, he got on Facebook, so maybe the Americans are helping with Facebook, but he said, if you believe that we should be part of Europe, come to the square. And that's what they did, and I don't understand why Putin gets a veto on what Mustafa Naim wants for his country. Thank you, Michael.